full screen and then let me see how about now everybody not yet uh not yet please turn on again okay so screen sharing has stopped because okay let, let me try it again mm -hmm. I usually um, have my virtual conference, virtual meeting in, at my office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but because of the time zone difference, I have to like do yes. it at home today. Mm -hmm. So I have to figure out like how to use my uh, home computer. <laughs> <laughs> I think I should share this screen. Okay, can good. Everybody, can good. everybody see my Very screen good. now? All right, Very good. Let me, let me move it. Okay, everybody, let, let's start. So uh, today I'm going to, I'm, first off, again, I'm so... Sorry. <laughs> yeah. First of all, I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to, to share my research in this uh, event. Um, so I'm going to talk about, you know, some current research in artificial intelligence in our industry, our discipline for service delivery. So let me briefly kind of introduce myself again. Like my name is Oscar. You can just call me Oscar. Mm -hmm. uh, and my Chinese name is Heng Xuan. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that here's my email address. So if you have any questions or maybe you know, during or after the, uh, the presentation, please feel free to email me. And uh, again, I'm a current assistant professor at the Department of uh, Tourism, Hospitality and Event Management mm -hmm. at the, the University of Florida. So my research area is uh, primarily consumer behavior focus actually so like but more specifically i'm currently doing a lot of research in ai application uh, especially in human ai interaction human ai um, you know uh, behaviors technology acceptance and i also do research in information processing like to understand how different information influence people's behavior and as well as a uh, general consumer or travelers well-being and uh, sustainability. So that's my research area. So in this presentation, well, I'm going to cover three major kind of topic. One is I'm going to briefly talk about the background of AI in our industry, um, in the service industry. And the second uh, is that I'm going to you know, talk about some of my existing and also current studies regarding AI. And then lastly, I'm going to briefly talk about the future research directions uh, and uh, you know, quickly talk about, like, in general, the AI research in our mm -hmm. discipline. So everybody, uh, I don't know how many of you have actually watched this movie before. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the imitation game. So basically, the main character in this movie is Alan Turing a very, very, very important person in the history of AI, because he is the first person uh, who proposed the idea of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And here is the sentence like, uh, you know, <laughs> I directly cited from, uh, from my attorney, humans use available information as well as reason in order to solve problems and make decisions. So why can't machines do the same thing? But that was the earliest proposition about artificial intelligence, the concept. So uh, what is AI? I, I hope everybody can think about that because like, it is uh, a complex question and there is no mm. consensus nowadays mm. in the industry because in different disciplines, mm. people give different definitions to AI. So you may want to think about like, like for example, my kids they really like to use Alexa. Is uh, you know is a kind of voice assistance uh, device at home, and is that is Alexa an AI? Is a self-driving vehicle an AI? Right? Mm -hmm. Is a like I don't know how many of you notice that like we are using Zoom right now. So there mm -hmm. is a touch-up function, like basically make people looks a little bit younger <laughs> mm -hmm. through camera. Right? Is that a function an AI? So based on different definitions of AI, you know. I want to say all, all of that, all of these examples can be called artificial intelligence. So uh, in the field of a service uh, industry, so researchers generally use a more practical approach to, to define the term artificial intelligence. So basically the definition suggests that AI basically refers to a battery of technologies 
that allow a machine to exhibit certain aspects of uh, human behaviors or human intelligence, you know, such as to, to sense, to understand, uh, to behave, and more importantly, to learn. So based on this definition, you can see like a lot of devices nowadays we are currently using can be called artificial intelligence devices. So uh, this uh, figure basically summarizes the history of the development of AI. Um, as you can see, like this here is Alan Turing. Right? In 1950, Alan Turing proposed the idea of artificial intelligence. And 60 years later, in the, at the conference of Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence, so this is the conference firstly coined the, idea, the, the name, the term, artificial intelligence. So AI yeah, has a really, really long history. And um, as you can see, in around like 1970, you know, people really have well, had a very high expectation toward the, the capability of artificial intelligence. Mm. And if you can see that, like from three to eight years, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of a human being. That's, that's what, people, what people said mm. back in 1970. So people had a very high expectation. And uh, this very high expectation actually leads to an AI winter in uh, around 1990. Mm -hmm. So a couple of reasons. Why is, one is that people you know, just had too much expectation toward artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And then in reality, um, you know, because of a lot of constraint on, in terms of technology, in terms of, in terms of computer hardware, mm -hmm. so we cannot uh, you know, achieve certain level of artificial intelligence. Like, you know, so basically the real technology basically make people feel so disappointed. <laughs> That's one factor. Another mm -hmm. factor it was the fast development of a personal computer. So basically distract people's mm -hmm. attention from, you know, from AI. So as we can, as we can see, we're like basically we, we experienced an AI winter. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, this AI, uh, people's interest in AI become like, how to say, like reignited again you know, mm -hmm. after 2010, because of three very important factors. The first one is big data. So we all know that in order to have a very powerful, let's say machine learning model, mm -hmm. it requires a huge amount of data set, right? So big data allows, actually allows us to, you know, to utilize, to, uh, to basically to allow, allow, allow us to give us a weapon to train those uh, complex algorithms, complex AI model. And the second thing is deep learning. So actually, in the history of AI, we had deep learning many, many, many years ago, decades ago. It's not a new te technology, mm -hmm. but it was not feasible until we have big data. Mm -hmm. you know, as, as I mentioned, like the learning model mm -hmm. and the data, they are kind of like they, are, um, they help each other. Mm -hmm. So the third factor is the development of robotic technology and the natural language processing. So robotic and the natural language processing. So basically this enables, you know, the social presence of AI and also enable, it to enable AI to directly communicate with human. Because of these three major drivers, you know, we have, you know, AI reignited again, like mm -hmm. uh, after 2010. Mm -hmm. So to summarize, there are four major stages of AI development or called AI development focus. So back in how many years? Seventy years ago, back in 1950s, we have we have we have the concept of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And in the first 30 years of AI development, our focus is to just to demonstrate the concept of AI. Mm -hmm. You know, we have we can have something that can mimic mimic a human behavior. That's it. Mm -hmm. And then from the 1980s, in the following 30 years. Mm -hmm people focus on machine learning. So as mm. you can see, machine learning is also not a new topic. Mm. And in that 30, 30 years, three decades, people focus on to use AI to solve some real world problems. But because of, again, because of a hardware issue, because of a algorithm, because of the limit, limitation of data, we can only solve very simple issues, not complex issues. Mm. However, after 2010, people's focus be, focus on deep learning. So that is like we have data available. 
and we also have a you know pretty powerful hardware computer hardware uh, hardware and uh, we also have a you know strong enough algorithm so we can use deep learning to solve complex issues and what is the trend of AI now? So as you can observe, like nowadays, I don't know how many of you are currently using ChatGPT or similar <laughs> technology, <laughs> right? So, uh, well, I don't know how many of you have uh, uh, actually interact with a robot in, let's say, hospitality services before. So nowadays, people focus on to to uh, to use AI to develop to develop something that can directly interact with human. So in other words, that is a, like human AI interaction or human robot interaction. That is to use AI to be able a machine to be act as a social entity rather than a machine. So that's the future trend. That's not the future. That's the current trend, and also that's the will be, will be the future focus of the development of AI. Oscar. I, yes. uh, just one comment on sure. this entire process, uh, entire history of a uh, four stage of AI development since uh, uh, 1960, uh, 1956, uh, Alan Turing, and up to now, ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. uh, we are currently we are focusing on human robot interaction through the uh, you know uh, Android and robotic and uh, ChatGPT and Google in Germany and something like that. Mm -hmm. And the issue for us, us means uh, the student or researcher who are uh, studying on hospitality and tourism and the leisure, mm -hmm. focusing on how to match our task, types mm -hmm. of task uh, fit into the uh, robot or the AI. Mm -hmm. or improving our uh, job efficiency, employee efficiency, yes. and mm -hmm. productivity and, uh, uh, and, and, and the service uh, uh, sort of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, absolutely, we are not expert of the engineering part, but mm -hmm. we are focusing on the interface between the human and AI for our you know, job type in the domain of uh, hospitality and tourism, uh, right? Exactly. Yeah, right. exactly. That, exactly, Dr. Cook. That's, uh, sh that should be our focus. Mm -hmm. And later on, I'm going to like talk, talk uh, about like, uh, give everybody a more kind of a deliberation regarding what we should focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's a very good comment. Thank you, Professor Ku. Okay. Yeah, let uh, me keep going. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nowadays there's a trend. Like I think a lot of people, a lot of a lot of, a lot of us actually can observe that there's a trend of using artificial intelligence agents to provide services in our industry mm -hmm. because of three major factors. The first one again is the development of technology, robotic, mm -hmm. machine learning. You know, uh, 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 consequently, those AI devices nowadays sometimes can perform equally well, or sometimes outperform human employees for mm -hmm. a lot of service tasks. And the second major reason is an uh, economic driver. So the, we can see like all around the world, we can see a decrease in technology cost. We can see a huge increase in labor cost. And this is especially true in the US. The labor cost uh, in the service industry increased a lot you know, after the pandemic. So a lot, of industry, a lot of companies in the service industry suffers because of the increase in labor cost. So basically, these first first those are companies to think about another way to provide the services, such as using you know artificial intelligence, using robots, and the third factor is a social factor. So in many countries in uh, in Europe and in some countries in Asia, I believe uh, South Korea could be one example. <laughs> that is aging, right? Social aging. Yes, definitely. There, yeah, there are not enough young labor to provide the uh, you know basic services, especially. Um, you know, in the U.S., there are, are not enough labor to provide the senior care services. So that's yes. critical. Yes, very well. And uh, yeah, so because of these reasons, I mean, in the future, using AI, using artificial intelligence uh, devices, powered devices, using robots yes. to provide the services becomes a must. Uh -huh. So um, in the service delivery, we can also observe some uh, changes because of uh, the technology. So first of all, from the service provider's perspective, so we can see more and more service providers are interested in using AI to improve their operating efficiency. 
And in our industry, when we interview the, uh, the industry people, I mean, a hotel and the restaurant, so those people are interested in using AI to provide a more customized or personalized services, make their services special, so they can have a more competition power uh, in the market. And from consumer behavior perspective, what we can observe is that you know people become more and more technology dependent. They rely on technology, technology to do everything. <laughs> and also, uh, comparing to previously assume, that, like we usually assume, Mm. That in service delivery, especially in hospitality service, we require social interaction. Mm. But we, what we observe nowadays is that, especially for younger generations, you know, timeliness is sometimes more important than social interaction. So as long as you know you can provide a faster service, I, I'm going to prefer that. Mm. And uh, we also observe that there is an increasing acceptance toward the technologies, especially from those younger generations, and also for some countries, the older generation as well. Mm. So as you can see, there's a lot of changes in consumer behavior uh, in this industry. So the current application of AI in the service delivery, so a lot of technologies. Behind the scenes, we are using facial recognition, right? So in the US, some hotels are using like kind of facial recognition. Basically, they install a camera uh, by the hallway of a hotel, and when customers are walking in, the technology can recognize the customer's face and provide the customer's name to front desk employees. So instead of using a general term to greet, him, to greet uh, customers, you know, front desk employees can, use, can call the customer's name, so show more personalized services. And also, AI yeah, is revenue management system. So yeah, this semester, everybody, this semester I'm currently teaching uh, traditional revenue management classes to, mm -hmm. uh, to the UF students. Mm. And I, the first class, I told them, like, you know, the way of doing revenue management in the hotel industry has already changed. You know, before, we use a human calculation, human prediction, but now we use artificial intelligence, mm. right? Mm. So in terms of frontline agents, we use what chatbots, we use conversational AI, such as ChatGPT, which basically is a generative conversational AI, right? Everybody is a generative conversational AI, that's ChatGPT. And we also use a recommendation engine. We use uh, smart devices everywhere. And mm -hmm. we also use uh, AI robots. Like we have, we are using a lot of AI devices nowadays in service delivery. Mm -hmm. So, but I want to ask a question. So why is AI different from traditional technology? So when, as a researcher, when we are doing research in AI, uh, we usually receive the reverse comments, right? Like why does your study focus on you call the artificial intelligence device rather than a general technology, uh, you know, field, mm -hmm. because a lot of studies actually, you know, can be conceptualized or can be conducted under a much broader umbrella that is traditional technology. Why you you want to do your study under the umbrella of AI? You mm -hmm. have to justify, right? You, mm -hmm. We always receive this type of information. Mm -hmm. So I think it's also a very important question. Like before we actually conducting. Um, a research, we have to carefully think about like why does my study ma like matter in terms of artificial intelligence? Like what does my study can contribute to artificial intelligence rather than a much broader traditional technology field? So, um, so here I want to you know briefly talk about my opinion. So from technology perspective, so we have to conceptually understand uh, what is our research object. So in other words, what is the device? What is the technology device we actually, we are doing research about? So um, when we talk about AI agents, so basically the AI agent has two major components. One is uh, architecture. In other words, that's hardware. <laughs> Another one is program, that's software, right? So the architecture basically is, uh, uh, is the, uh, the sum of sensors and actuators. And based on the, the use of sensors and based on the capability of actuators, so basically those architecture decides what the AI agent can do. Oh. For example, like they say, let me see, our traditional camera, mm. right? It has an image sensor, mm. and it also has an actuator that is our shutter shutter button, right? We are, once we click the shutter button, the, mm. cam, the the image sensor captures the image. 
right, everybody? So that's basically a, a, a technology device. But mm. it, of course, it is not an AI device because it doesn't have it doesn't have an AI program. Mm. So it, actually, it's the AI program decides how intelligence the device is. So in terms of like you know the uh, the our study object, our technology AI devices. So before we are doing a research, we actually we have to understand what is our assumption regarding our AI intelligence. What is our is, what is uh, our assumption? What is our like uh, hypothetic, or like what is our um, what is the intelli intelligent level of the, the devices we are doing research about? Right, that's one assumption you have to think about, because that's usually make your your device make your uh, study topic different from those traditional technologies. Oscar, um, yes. Uh, what do you think about? Uh, this my question about uh, like um, okay uh, this case ha have you seen the Sora software mm -hmm. uh, generated by image generation uh, the ChatGPT four point five four point zero yes uh -huh. the Sora uh, image generation is provide very well made the artificial images mm -hmm. uh, uh, to us by ordering. Uh, the users. So yes. uh, currently, at least, we people place an order to AI, uh, and we can demand the certain types of the destination image or mm -hmm. marketing promotion image. That is is quite related to sensible sensory, you know, uh, destination yeah. online image sort of things. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the technology actually can be able to realize the kind of artificial online image, but you know, uh, as a as a as a researcher or as a you know practitioner from the hospitality and tourism, anyway, we have to make our own design for uh, for for our own purpose, like a marketing promotion or mm -hmm. something, uh, corporate paper. Uh, from Seoul destination sort of things. So what do you think, what kind of a research question we can get from that the image generations? Oh, that's a very good question, Professor Ku. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sora, uh -huh. I think Sora is currently under like uh, beta, beta, uh, we only have beta version, right? Like, because I, I, I usually, I, I hope I can try the like, Sora, but I, you know, it's hard for me to get uh, the access of that software. <laughs> yeah. It's really, really cool, uh, um, you know, generative, generative AI. So it's yeah. like a video generative, uh, video, video generative AI. Uh, what do you call it? generative video <laughs> AI? So very cool. In terms, of, in terms of research questions, I feel like there are, you know, because my research focuses more on psychology. Okay. You know, like AI, human behavior. So from my uh, my my um, uh, research background, I feel like a, a couple of research questions we have, we can think about. One is, uh, for for example, does our traditional do our tra traditional theories in information processing still applies when people are process the info the video provided by Sora? Uh -huh. Right, that could be one. Study which can uh, um, which focus more on the theoretical part, like why those uh -huh. traditional information processing theory still work. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, that's one. And another thing is that I want to see if I I'm going to do research, I'm, I probably want to see like how does uh, the promotion video provided or developed by Sora influence uh -huh. uh, customers, uh, let's say travel travel tourism behaviors or visiting yes. intention. Right, uh -huh. that could be one. Um, um, topic. So actually, later on, I'm going to show you one study, very similar, uh -huh. very very similar to uh, to Sora one. Uh -huh. I'm going to share with everybody um, regarding uh, is, is, is that study also is related to information processing. So what I want to say is that our the use of AI basically challenges our assumption. So our existing theory are basically developed based on our assumption of the world, right? However, nowadays there is a kind of a new type of thing, new type of agents, you know, come coming out <laughs> in, the, in our real world. So, a lot of theories, 
we have utilized before, we rely on before. Mm. You know, basically our study shows that those theories do not work in the context of artificial intelligence. Mm. So which means that it requires a lot of theory development. So we have to develop a lot of new theories, you know, basically aims to explain human's behavior toward artificial intelligence mm -hmm. or explain, the, you know, the interaction between human and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and AI. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but that, so, yeah, but, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Like uh, the image generation um, the, by Sora is already, already is, is fantastic uh, one. And the problem is uh, uh, how to, how to reduce the gap between the online image generation between our mentally imaging processing. Like, uh, like when you said we are uh, research on psychology and the psychology means we are thinking about our stereotype of a soul image and mm -hmm. we place an order to AI, hey, make one uh, the uh, promotion image for, for, for our conference. And then AI, they uh, automatically and they generate their own image. But however, it's a pretty much a gap between the AI image generation and then the human original, you know, uh, psychological, uh, you know, thinking. Exactly. So, so, so then we can find out the research gap between the AI image generation and the human, you know, uh, way of the, the thinking and concept. Mm -hmm. And it it can be manipulated that that you know impact um, exactly mm -hmm. exactly I mean uh, yeah I, I personally I believe that there will be a lot of new research research topics regarding yes. Sora <laughs> you know, yeah. in our yeah. huge huge research issues occurred uh, yes. based on the that the online image generation and the human psychology. Exactly, exactly. Uh, later on, I'm going to show you one study, one example study about uh, uh, generative AI. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's go back to uh, to the kind of our conceptually understand our study objects, right? So when people develop uh, the term uh, humanoid social robots, so basically the definition suggest, uh, you know, highlights two parts. One is the, the, the devices equipped with the uh, anthropomorphic features. So that is the example of architecture, right, everybody? And the second one is that the device, you know, is uh, able to engage customers on a social level. So basically that's the AI program, that's the, your intelligence level of your, your devices. So just want to give everybody an example. And uh, from a social science perspective, this is basically <laughs> what I usually do. I justify okay why my study is an AI study rather than a general technology study. <laughs> so that's basically my justification on my papers. So, so from a social science perspective, uh, when people are interacting with uh, AI versus these traditional technologies, they show different behaviors. So for example, the AI device is intelligent devices, and the traditional technology is non-intelligence devices. So from a technology acceptance perspective, like you know, people need little, needs a, a little for effort to learn how to use AI devices because it's, it's an intelligence device, it's pretty easy to use. However, as for traditional technology devices, you know, usually people need to spend a certain level of uh, effort to learn how to use that. But more importantly, AI device is a mixture of machine and a human. So uh, yes, think about everybody, it's a mixture of machine and a human. And versus traditional technology is basically a machine only. So the mixer, mixture of machine and human allow AI to behave like humans and communicate the customers on the human on the social level. Mm. You know, they are our social entity. Mm. And the study have shown that people are actually use a different, uh, you know, uh, appraisals to evaluate AI devices. They tend to use both cognitive and emotional evaluations to evaluate the AI devices. Yeah. And since a lot of AI devices are used to replace human employees, basically this challenges people's tra traditional perception of services. That, as I mentioned, social interaction. Do we still need a social interaction? You know, to our, or basically we can interact with the AI devices. So as a result, like, you know, in short, when we talk about the traditional technology, we usually use the, the verb to use. 
And in contrast, when we talk about AI devices, we use the term inter interaction. So we actually interact with AI devices. So uh, yeah, so AI, a social entity, was is traditional technology a tool only. So that's basically from social science perspective, really what we, you know, we can use to justify like why, you know, our study is AI is about AI, or like whether our study contributed to, to AI. Um, let me quickly summarize this, like, because I also received a lot of questions regarding this one. So, um, so I just want to share, like, with everybody. So I was hired by the University of Florida as uh, an AI scholar. But you, you all know, like, my research is in social science, right? Our consumer behavior is basically social science. So the first day when I meet with, uh, with the president of the UF, I was asked, like, from social science perspective, why does you know, social science matter in terms of uh, AI. <laughs> so I want to say like AI is a multi-disciplinary uh, technology. Yes. You know, it requires knowledge from different disciplines. As you can see on this uh, slide, you know, a lot of, of a lot of those a lot of those major disciplines are basically social science, psychology, linguistics, right, business. And uh, my research focuses more on you know the, the last part, psychology. So I'm going to introduce some of my uh, studies uh, to uh, share some of, some of some of my studies with, our, with everybody here. So I'm currently doing research from three major branches about uh, about AI. The first one is AI acceptance. So instead of sharing one or two studies, I'm going to share with you a series of my AI acceptance studies. And I want to show like the logic you know, between each study. And uh, nowadays, I am doing a lot of studies in terms of uh, how AI, how, how the application of AI changes human behavior. Um, so I'm going to show you one example uh, in that. And I also do uh, doing a lot of study, you know, regarding the dark side of artificial artificial intelligence, such as uh, FAT, transparency, accountability, and uh, fairness, just such as privacy issues. I'm also doing a lot of studies in that. This, Actually, this dark side is actually quite popular in the U.S. You know, because of the U.S. is kind of uh, a lot of uh, demo people with a different demo uh, demographic background. So fairness is a big issue in the U.S. Yeah, let me share like um, a series of my AI acceptance study and the one example of my behavioral changes study. Yeah, so why? Do people want to use, or why do people want to object using artificial intelligence? Mm. So this study, actually, this branch of study actually was started from 2018, 2017, like uh, a couple of years, how many years? About five, more than five, like six years ago, a long time ago. Wow. Yeah, when I was a PhD student, actually. Oh. Yeah, when I was a PhD student. <clears throat> so at the beginning, our research question was to like to understand like why people want to use artificial intelligence. So in this study, we developed a theoretical, theoretical framework to explain mm. why mm. customers want to use AI. Mm. So the study is called the AI device use acceptance framework in service delivery. Um, you know, nowadays if you Google AI DUA framework, you can find the paper. Mm. And the paper was published in the International Journal of uh, Information Management. So actually, I published a lot, a lot of my papers in um, management information system journals rather than our oh. discipline. Mm -hmm. yeah. So really, you you published the, this paper in the in in the journal of information management before the ChatGPT emerged. Exactly, exactly. Wow. This paper You're was published, of AI, yeah, This know, paper was uh, accepted in 2000, 2019. Wow. Yeah. Was, really? Actually, this paper was uh, was write, written uh, in two thousand seventeen. So is that kind oh. of like several years ago? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, real pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> first, uh, yeah, one of the first groups of scholars in this field. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, let, let me quickly talk about theoretical background of uh, the study. Uh -huh. So before, uh, before we develop this framework, usually when people want to do some research regarding artificial intelligence, they use a TAM, technology acceptance model, or Utah, unified theory of acceptance and use of technology. So these are two frameworks. And however, a lot of studies actually suggest that some factors um, proposed by 
those traditional technology acceptance frameworks uh, do not work in the context of uh, AI artificial intelligence because of several reasons. One is, as I mentioned, non-intelligence devices versus intelligent devices, right? So one factor, for example, easy to use, basically doesn't apply to artificial intelligence. Theoretically, it doesn't apply. And empirically, the same. People found like easy to use doesn't apply to AI device. And the second reason is that different performance measures, as I mentioned, when people are evaluating the use of AI devices, they tend to use both cognitive and emotional evaluations. And more importantly, because AI, because of AI is a new technology, you know, there is a co existence of acceptance and objection. So in, what, in other words, people, for some reason, people want to use AI, but on the other hand, they may psychologically feel like I'm not want to use that. You know, there is a, there is a struggling behavior in the context of using AI devices. So because of that, we, uh, you know, go back from a more theory focused approach. We use uh, this model It's actually based on cognitive appraisal theory. So basically suggests that people's uh, behavior intention is driven by their emotion and the emotion was developed through, you know, different uh, cognitive appraisal process. And here is a model. So the first, on the first level, you know, people's social influence, hedonic motivation and anthropomorphism influence people's uh, higher level of appraisal, such as performance expectancy and the perceived effort expectancy of using AI devices. Hmm. And this second level cognitive uh, factors leads to their emotion. Hmm. And this emotion leads to both willingness, willingness to use and also object, objection to the use. Hmm. And one new thing or contribution of this model is uh, anthropomorphism. This is the first technology acceptance model consider the construct named anthropomorphism. Basically, refers to people perceive the human likeness level of a device. And in our first, uh, in the AI DOA model, we basically we propose that anthropomorph anthropomorphism will really lead to a negative impact mm -hmm. on people's evaluation of AI because of, uh, uh, you know, a human-like device threatens people's uh, human identity. So that's the mm. reason. Mm. <clears throat> and here is what we found. So basically the empirical data validate the framework. And uh, we, uh, the framework also highlighted that like, emotion play, plays a very important role in generating people's uh, behavior intentions and also confirm the negative role of anthropomorphism. However, this framework was only tested in a very general service setting uh, context. So the following study, we want to understand, okay, whether, first of all, whether this framework, the same framework can apply uh, to different, uh, different service contexts. And then we want to understand, okay, whether different types of service matter or alters people's behavior intention to use AI devices. So that's the second paper. I've been, I can't remember which year, but this paper I think is published in 2020 mm. uh, by uh, JTR, I believe. So basically this paper aims to examine like the use of AI devices in either a more utilitarian or a more hedonic services by comparing airline. Airline you know, is a more uh, utilitarian focused service and the hospitality service is a more hedonic uh, focused service. And this is what we found, all right? We, use, we test the same framework and do a, basically a multi-group SEM analysis. <clears throat> and what we found is that like, when people are looking for a utilitarian services, um, their performance expectancy of AI is much higher compared to a hedonic service. So in other words, like, you know, it's a, it's AI probably is a, more appreciate <laughs> in a functional service settings rather than a hedonic service settings. And we also found that overall, the overall willingness to accept the use of AI is significantly lower among hospitality customers. And uh, this, the study also found that like social interaction, you know, in hospitality service, social interaction is a, a greatly influence people's perceived hedonic value of the service. So that's why like, you know, hedonic of, Focus the service. You know, people shows a lower intention to use AI. Mm. 
So basically, these studies suggest that you know AI devices should be used to empower human employees rather than to replace them, especially under a hedonic context. Okay, my comment on the paper. Um, okay, sure. uh, let me see your previous slide, the research model. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, 2019. So this, uh, this is uh, yeah, this is the model for the uh, yeah. For this the, is model. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I think you uh, brought the the concept of anthropomorphism into your mm -hmm. research model, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, in those time, 2019. Uh, 2019, uh, probably anthropomorphism is quite interesting, you know, variable in the context of a humanoid robot, and uh, because it looks like a human interface. Yes. But since that time, the after emergence of ChatGPT, ChatGPT is a text-based uh, dialogue system. Mm -hmm. So ChatGPT is much like a human-like conversation, and mm -hmm. which is another. Uh, the anthropomorphism type, like okay. a human conversation. So probably since those time, um, the anthropomorphism has evolved, evolutionized to the conversational anthropomorphism and mm -hmm. like a human-like conversation with humors, with the angry, with uh, like a format of like a interaction and dialogue. So uh, I, I think is is. Pretty much anthropomorphism, the concept is enlarge the types of language and face mm -hmm. and and uh, acting like and uh, human like and um, uh, something psychological, you know, uh, approach. So it's a, it's a very good, you know, uh, the early papers, I guess. Yes, thank you, Professor Ku. Thank you for your comment. Yeah. So basically, in this paper, in this particular one. The measurement scale we used to measure anthropomorphism is a pretty broad scale. Mm -hmm. It's very general. Like for example, one item is that do you think the AI has a, its own, own, own uh, its own will, mm -hmm. own intention, mm -hmm. or like do you, what what is your perception regarding the human likeness level of the AI? Like these are very general items. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, yeah, I totally agree. Anthropomorphism mm -hmm. is a multi-dimensional construct. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Not only about appearance, but also about behaviors, about uh, intentions, uh -huh. uh, about intelligence. Right? Uh -huh. It's a, a multi-dimensional construct. Uh -huh. Yeah, actually, I'm uh, currently have one paper uh -huh. um, conceptualize the uh, four dimensions of anthropomorphism, uh -huh. and the paper is currently under review. <laughs> uh -huh. okay. So yeah, so I'm not like yeah. So I, I I'm afraid I cannot share the paper today. But I hope I hopefully the paper will. You know, it will be available pretty soon. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but thank you, Professor Ku. Thank you for your comment. Sure. Yeah, so the, yeah. <clears throat> so the model on the screen is a model we used for the uh, JTR study. Um, and as you can see, there is one extension. I don't know whether you noticed, but there is one extension of this model comparing to the previous, uh, let me find it, previous uh, or original AI DOA model. I see that like there is a there is one line missing here in the old model. So basically, what we suggest is that in the hospitality context, you know, people's hedonic motivation regarding the services also influence their also influence their uh, their emotion. So basically, that's uh, why we add one line here to increase uh, the model's uh, explain explanation power and. But if you can, if you compare those uh, we call pass coefficients, like hedonic motivation, in both service contexts, it's kind of like the pass coefficient is higher than zero point seven. Let's say performance only about zero point two. Effort in some in one context in the certain hotel context is not significant, but in airline context is only like negative zero point one. Hedonic motivation so shows much stronger power, you know, to influence people's emotions. So what does this mean? It basically means that when people are making decisions toward the use of AI, they basically they are, they are driven by the motivation of uh, looking for fun, looking for entertainment. I mean, this could be true when people are looking for a new technology or a new thing to try. However, in terms of uh, 
yeah, the intention is used for fun. So maybe this will work. But in terms of long-term use, you know, it's different from intention to use for fun, right? That's different, different thing. So in a later study, we want to understand, okay, what factors will, will lead people's long-term intention to use artificial intelligence? And in, te in the technology domain, uh, one factor, which usually results in a long-term relationship between uh, a human, between a user and a technology, that is trust. So basically in this study, <clears throat> we developed a model to understand uh, like how people's trust in interaction with the social robots was uh, generated, like what is a psychological process. And uh, yeah, so basically this study utilized the, uh, the framework of a human computer interaction and which suggests that uh, you know, the trust in interaction with the social robot is likely to generate it through three dimensions. The first one is uh, a trustworthy robot function and design. So basically, this factor re uh, relates to people's trust associated with the characteristics of AI. And the second, um, second uh, dimension is uh, people's propensity to trust in the robot. If some people, the you know, like we are human, some of us like are more likely to trust in others. Some of us are less likely to trust in others, right? Those propensity. And this propensity can be influenced by different factors, such as technology identity, such as, you know, a lot of different factors. So that's the second dimension. And uh, the third dimension is a trustworthy service tasks and context. So basically the study suggests that, you know, without a specific context, we cannot understand that people's behavior toward, toward artificial intelligence. So one example, uh, I think it's a long time ago, back in 2017. So there is a study <clears throat> um, conducted by a group of scholars in Russia. And they want to understand like people's different acceptance level toward the use of, of robots in different service contexts. And then what they found is that they found you know, people are more likely to use AI, use robots in terms of uh, logistic, like transportation, like uh, moving some items, like uh, deliver packages. So, so in, these, in those cases, people want to use robots. But in terms of fit, the service uh, services requires a physical touch, such, such as massage. People do not want to use AI, do not want to, do not want to use robots. So basically, this study, uh, study suggests that service context matter. And here is the model we uh, have developed. And as you can see, there are, this is called, uh, this is a three-level three uh, uh, model. So the first order level uh, is, uh, for, we call formative indicators to predict each dimension. And then we have three major dimensions of trust. And then those three dimensions explains the overall trust in social service robots. Wow, <laughs> great. Yes, thank wow. you, Brother <clears throat> yeah, that's a, a, this, is a, this is a skill development paper. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, published in uh, Computers and Human Behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so uh, there's one thing I want to highlight. <laughs> so that is the past coefficient of, of anthropomorphism on trust. So in this mm -hmm. case, as you can see, you can see we find a party, positive <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, relationship between anthropomorphism and trust. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so here is a kind of a conclusion of this particular study. So the study first of all conceptualized the construct of a social robot interaction trust. And the conceptualization is that you know, trust is a belief that interactions with AI social robots can provide a positive service outcomes. It's very general, very general uh, um, conceptualization, but we uh, please pay attention, we conceptualize trust as a belief, a cognitive belief. <clears throat> and we develop a scale, uh, you know, social robot trust. And uh, more, but more importantly, as I mentioned, this study validate actually in terms of long-term use, in terms of developing trust, as a promotion actually plays a positive effect. So people are looking for different things rather than, you know, human identity. <laughs> People are looking for different things. Mm -hmm. 
consider different things when the, when uh, when developing an intention to to use a, a robot in long run. <coughs> and throughout, as you can see, we we have conducted a battery of studies already. However, throughout this study, throughout those uh, the battery of studies, we still have uh, some research questions <laughs> regarding people's intention or objection to use AI. Mm. So one is that, like as you can see on the screen, that is uh, the old the traditional original <laughs> AI DOA framework. And what is the role of trust in people's uh, in the generation of uh, behavior intention? Like what is the role of trust? So that's one of our research questions. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, this framework actually was based on the theory of a cognitive appraisal theory, which highlights the role of emotion. However, there's another theory called the tripartite model of attitude. So basically based on tripartite model of attitude, people's behavioral intention is likely to be influenced by you know, their emotional response as well as their cognitive beliefs toward an object. So in other words, behavior intention is likely to, to be driven by both emotional and the cognitive evaluations. Mm -hmm. So that's our first research questions. And our second research question is that how does uh, people with a different cultural backgrounds perceive AI differently? Like one example is like cars, like vehicles. I don't know like how about in Korea, but uh, uh, in Europe, when people talk about luxury car, people basically, you know, refers to maybe uh, how comfortable, like whether the quality of material or performance of the vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. But when talk about luxury car in the US, uh, people usually feel like, okay, bigger is better. <laughs> as, long, as long as the car is large, uh -huh. it's luxury, right? Like, you know, like, as you can see, like you know, especially toward technology products, people with yeah. different cultural backgrounds show different uh, uh, preferences. Uh -huh. But how about like in terms of AI robots? Mm -hmm. So we want to understand these two major questions. So we conducted another study named uh, the impacts of trust and culture on the acceptance of AI hospitality robots, and the paper was also published in the International Journal of Information Management. And this paper was published last year, actually, uh, in 2023. And here is a model. So we previous, previously con conceptualized the trust in robot, right? So basically, um, drawing on the tripartite theory of attitude, we put the trust as a higher order cognitive belief in the uh, pre uh, traditional original AIDA model. And we also utilized the Hofstadt's uh, cultural dimensional theory to test whether, you know, different cultural dimensions can moderate people's evaluation of uh, AI robots. And uh, here is what we found. <clears throat> uh, by the way, this study utilized the data from collected from both uh, uh, the U.S. customers and the Chinese customers. So we can co we compare the culture of uh, the U.S. and China. And this study basically found that trust is a very <laughs> critical uh, factor to, uh, to, uh, to influence people's behavior intention as well as an objection uh, of the use of AI. And uh, we also highlight several moderation effects of uh, national cultures as well as, as uh, individual cultural values. Mm. And here is some kind of guidance we provided uh, using the results of this study. So in terms of using AI robots under different cultural backgrounds, so here is what we should do. Mm. So in, first of all, in terms of promote uh, robot, our robotic services. So in the US, which is a low uncertainty avoidance culture, so it, <clears throat> basically what we should do is that we should highlight the hedonic value of the devices. Uh, like, you know, it's interesting, it's fun, it's entertaining. Mm. And uh, um, <clears throat> Um, on the other hand, in China, which is a high uncertainty avoidance culture, we should emphasize two things. One is the social recognition via, via like social media. Like maybe we should we should, we can show some advertisements that uh, other customers are using, you know, like robotic services. 
-hmm. because when people are under a high uncertainty of avoidance culture, the the role of a social influence is stronger. <clears throat> and the second thing is we should highlight the kind of the more you know instead of hedonic value, but the more utilitarian value. That is the performance of the device. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of robot design, what we found is that in the US, which is a short-term <laughs> oriented culture, so we should, uh, you know, reduce the level of anthropomorphism. So people are more worried about anthropomorphism in the US. People feel more uh, more threats regarding anthropomorphic devices in the US, mm -hmm. because usually what we found is that uh, in a short-term oriented culture people are unlikely to accept uh, very new devices, very new technology. So we can highlight the novel design, highlight the hedonic value, but we should uh, you know, avoid using a too uh, isopomorphic device. So on the other hand, in China, which is a long-term oriented culture, you know, people tend to value high isopomorphism of, uh, of robots. So human-like design will be welcome <laughs> in China. Uh, but not yes, it, it's a comment on your papers, like sure. um, uh, high anthropo anthropomorphism and low high, low anthropomorphism. Uh, it's an interesting, you know, uh, very variable and interesting you know, research topic. Like uh, what I said, anthropomorphism is uh, human-like, uh, including voice, face, and act and psychology. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, AI is is not just a robot, it's not just a traditional technology. AI is 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 very much, you know, human like conversation, human like acting, human like interface. Exactly. So if we uh, investigate on high and low anthropomorphism toward a certain uh, specific customers coming from the China, Korea, and the US, we are pretty much behavior differently, very differently based on our culture. Like a US culture, you guys are talking a lot, interaction a lot between uh, human and human, especially teacher and the students. In exactly. China and Korea, they are just quiet and exactly. they don't have right. interaction at all. But however, they are uh, pretty much doing well, the productive and um, uh, and the, the efficient and efficient effectiveness in a way. That's right. So, so if we design the, the certain types of robots or certain types of you know uh, AI you know interface, probably we have to check that high anthropomorphism or low anthropomorphism which one is more effective toward the certain types of uh, customers, mm -hmm. which is very necessary at this moment. Exactly. I, I, I think so. Uh, exactly. So basically, uh, it uh, decides how the industry are going to, is going to develop different AI devices and use the, you know, in different countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Thank you for your comment, Professor Ku. And that's in terms of robot, de uh, robot design. And mm -hmm. uh, in terms of a uh, facilitating condition, like whether we should provide, a, we should allow, you know, provide some human employees to help customers to, to understand how to use the device. Mm -hmm. So what we found that is, uh, you know, since the US is a low power distance culture as Professor Ku just suggested. So like, you know, when people perceive that they need to use some effort mm -hmm. to, 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 to learn about uh, how to use the robots, they basically accept that. They feel like it is fine. It is probably a novel experience. <laughs> you know, it, it is more positive. Mm. So uh, based on the results of this study, we suggest that the minimal uh, you know, uh, requirements regarding facilitating is uh, needed mm. for the US customers. Mm. However, you know, China is a very high power distance culture. So for mm. Chinese customers, you know, they believe that the consumers, they are the king of the mm. service. So, we should not. We should enjoy the service, not like to spend the effort to learn. Mm. So in this case, what we found is that like effort expectancy plays a very strong role in mm. in China, you mm. know, comparing to the U.S. 
So based on the results, we suggest that like, you know, facilitating condition is highly recommended <laughs> in China. Mm -hmm. So that's the application uh, mm -hmm. uh, or like managerial implication of the study. <clears throat> so as I, yeah, I just like illustrated um, kind of a battery of my AI acceptance study. So hopefully, you know, I, I hopefully I showed you like the reasons or logic, you know, between one and the, the other studies in this uh, in this uh, presentation. And I also did some other studies regarding like um, AI acceptance, but I feel like, yeah, I feel like those, those studies I just show you is more important in my opinion. So I want to share with you another study. So this study is, you know, we we got the data analysis done three weeks ago, two weeks ago, actually, two weeks ago. And we are still like working on writing the manuscript and the manuscript is almost done. So it's a kind of a very like brand new study, a very brand new study. Oh. So that's focused on like how does AI, the application of AI changes uh, human behaviors. <clears throat> oh, by the way, a lot of pictures in my presentation slides are actually generated by AI, like this one. And uh, yeah, I'm not, like how, I believe you all heard this story, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? <laughs> and then <laughs> the mirror answered, Snow White is the fairest of them all, right, everybody? So and then the queen was so mad. What Snow White? No, nobody is more fair than I. <laughs> that, that's a, every time the queen asked the same question, uh, the mirror provided the same answer. So what does the story want to tell us? So in my opinion, basically the story, the story I want to tell us is the queen actually was using an outdated technology. So if uh, she is still alive, she can use a much better te technology nowadays, such as uh, generative AI, to ask the same question. And on behalf of the queen, I ask the same question to uh, ChatGPT, like who's the fairest of them all? And here, as you can see here, is the answer provided by the AI. And uh, so the first part, you know, it's important to acknowledge that beauty is subjective and varies greatly depending on individual preferences and cultural influences. So you're much safer answer, right, everybody? And then the AI provided a different, uh, a different uh, answer, Grace Kelly. So yeah, the queen may still disagree, but what she can easily do is that she can disapprove the answer and then you know, tell the AI the reason, not factually correct it. So hopefully it trains the AI model better. So that's technology we are actually using nowadays. We can train the model and people are actually using general generative AI, like such as ChatGPT for literally everything, especially here in the US, people are using AI for everything. So people are using AI nowadays, including asking for opinions, suggestions, recommendations, about a product or a service. And here is one example, um, a screenshot I, uh, I uh, actually took from uh, a very well-known OTA website in the US called TripAdvisor. It's basically an online travel agent. And the, yeah, here is a hotel by Marriott in, in our uh, small town, college town, Gainesville, Florida. And as you can see, this hotel has a pretty good rating, right? About 4.5 out of 5, a very good rating. And the hotel receives uh, nearly 1,300 customer reviews. Mm -hmm. So for a general customer like, like us, is, we can easily see the rating and understand, okay, the hotel is probably pretty good. Mm -hmm. But in terms of reasons, it's impossible for us to read through 1,300 reviews. That's too much information. Mm. So to help customers to read through those uh, review comments, um, TripAdvisor, they are using AI, generative AI to summarize customer reviews. And here is the example for the same hotel. And if you read uh, the review comments, you know, basically it includes the details of both pros and cons of the hotel, such as the location, like I-75 is a, is a, one of the major highway in Florida. So the hotel is pretty close to I-75, the highway. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, is a safe area, has a uh, comfortable breakfast staff, right? That's that's pros and also cons. Such, uh, you know, like uh, yeah, no uh, soundproofing issue, like, such as uh, the beating issue and so on, right? It has quite a lot of details. So it turns out that nowadays, when customers are booking for a hotel, they can receive information or review information from both human customers, AI yeah, agents. So however, the problem is that, like, okay, let's say customer are receive information from two information sources, human versus AI. But uh, how do customers process them differently? And uh, another question is that which of the information source is more effective in terms of influencing customers' uh, booking intention, right? So to understand these two questions, we uh, conducted uh, three experimental design studies. And to understand that, like, we basically want to think that is uh, our perception bias toward AI. <laughs> so that's what we want to prove. We, as a human, we have a bias. So as you can see, on the slide, that's the one example of the scenario we used in the study. So the review message, the, the lower part, the lower part are basically, basically identical between the two groups. The only difference is who provides the review. One is a, a customer, a professional travel advisor who, you know, like professional <laughs> trip advisor. Another one is ChatGPT. Review, you name it, review GPT. So that's the only difference. And here is uh, what we found. So first of all, how do customers process them differently? So what we found is that in terms of, uh, like when people are exposed to human generated uh, uh, review, people show a higher level of trust in terms of benevolent, in terms of integrity, However, you know, not in terms of uh, competence. So basically, people believe that human and AI, they have the same competence level in terms of uh, providing reviews. Uh, when, yes. I have uh, one question about sure. trust. Mm -hmm. Okay, trust. Um, the concept of trust have three different types of uh, sub dimensions, benevolence. Integrity mm -hmm. and competency. Um, the paper I published recently, mm -hmm. I measuring the benevolence and integrity and competency mm -hmm. dynamics among three variables. Mm -hmm. When benevolence high and low, when integrity high and low, when competency high mm -hmm. and low. And depending on that high and low dynamics, their attitude is uh, pretty much change. Yes. So, like, uh, like uh, the trust case, mm -hmm. probably the previous slide, like uh, you you comparing human and an AI with the same, you know, online review, which is a great, you know, comparison, and that, like, uh, once again, that the anthropomorphism case, high and low, or human and robot, probably impact on the benevolence, integrity, com competency of trustworthy or trust. So if we measure that uh, specific trust sub-dimensions with uh, high and low or uh, uh, anthropomorphism or human or uh, AI, this is a wonderful, you know, uh, research. Yes, topic, I exactly. Guess. We uh, we have no idea. Yeah, that, 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 I totally agree, Professor Ku. We have no idea, like, if we add anthropomorphic design mm -hmm. into the study, whether it will change or not. We have no mm -hmm. idea. Very mm -hmm. likely, if uh, my pro my proposition is that, like, say they say we have a very high anthropomorphic uh, devices, mm -hmm. probably like benevolence and integrity will be the same, like. You know, pe people basically re perceive human and AI the same thing, very likely. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So the anthropomorphism also uh, is a big concept, uh, construct. So there, there have sub dimensions or sub uh, variables like a benevolence, integrity, competency. So the anthropomorphism is like a voice anthropomorphism, face anthropomorphism, behavior anthropomorphism, something like that. So right. among those the three dynamics uh, in the anthropomorphism high level construct, probably they are differently impact on the people, how they perceive when uh, the voice anthropomorphism is high and low mm -hmm. and face anthropomorphism high and low and then what behavior anthropomorphism is high and low. Mm -hmm. So specifically, I guess is a structure education modeling cannot measure exactly how those three sub dimensions uh, dynamics happened. Yeah. So if you measure that dynamics among you know the anthropomorphism and trust, that is fantastic uh, research. Yes. Uh, so I, as I mentioned, like I'm currently you have one paper about the uh, anthropomorphism dimensions. Uh, it's currently under review. So I believe the paper should be coming out pretty soon. Mm -hmm. And I believe for, for your like suggestions, uh, the proposed study could be could be done by using experimental designs. So basically we can develop different uh, kind of, uh, we can use a real robot or e a easier ways to use videos to show mm -hmm. different level uh, um, in terms of anthropomorphism, we show different robots. Mm -hmm. And then to, to measure like how uh, people behavior behaviors changes after you know these also stimulus so we can mm -hmm. try that yeah but that's that's a, yeah I totally agree I totally agree anthropomorphism will be a big is, is a big thing <laughs> in human AI yeah, interaction mm -hmm. yes I totally agree Professor Ku that's a very good comment mm -hmm. yeah so that's what we found about trust mm -hmm. and on the other hand we found like when people are reading AI generated real messages comparing to the human ones they use significant more processing effort. And uh, this is reflected by, you know, spending more time to read the message and also capture a larger portion of uh, factual information from the message. So basically what we have done is that we, first of all, we measure how long people actually spend to you to read, uh, for example, these uh, review messages. Mm -hmm. And then we also, give them some uh, quizzes <laughs> after they read the message we give them a quizzes okay how like for example there are some uh, detailed information right like the 15 different options you know there are some detailed uh, information in the message and then we mm -hmm. test uh, how much information they actually remembered about the message mm -hmm. so we found that people have a higher score in terms of quiz quiz score and people people use significantly more time when they read the uh, yeah, ai message so that's what we found and which one is more effective? So in the last two studies, we want to test like which one is more effective. Mm -hmm. So we found what we found is that it depends. Mm -hmm. So when the review message is all uh, positive, what we found is that people tend to use big root to process both human and AI messages. That is less deliberation was involved. <laughs> and uh, in terms of uh, quick processing, since people trust in human more, so uh, we, we found like, you know, the human message is mm -hmm. a little bit higher persuasive power compared to the AI ones. So that's when the review message is positive. However, when the review message is negative, what we found is that like, you know, people still use quick processing rules to process the human information because of trust. People basically use trust as a peripheral cue to process the information. Uh, and also because of trust, the message shows a pretty high positivity power. And what we found is that people use a systematic route to process AI generated uh, negative review comments. And uh, also the message shows a very uh, high positivity power. So when the information was negative, the positivity power uh, are very similar uh, across different informations. But through different routes, one is uh, through trust, the other one is through the actual uh, the additional effort used to process the information. And uh, the implication of the study, uh, so when we should, like let's say if you are a service provider, you want to use some information to help your customers to make decisions. 
so which information you want to use. So in terms of a human generated review messages, what, what we found is that like our results basically suggest that it could be used as a pretty good testimonials to provide both positive and negative reviews. However, the study found that customers when they read the human generative review messages, they basically tend to capture the overall attitude, the overall sentiment of the message, rather than focus on uh, the factual content of the message. So to improve the persuasibility of uh, the message, you know, for human generated review, we should highlight, we should emphasize the credibility of reviewers. So on the other hand, in terms of AI generated message, um, we found this message is especially persuasive when perceived the service, uh, perceived decision related to a risk is high, such as when we, when we receive a negative review comment, we may think, okay, the problem, excuse me, the hotel is more, probably more problematic. So when the perceived risk is high, we found out, okay, this message works pretty well. And when customers are reading, uh, AI generated message, it focuses more on the factual content rather than the attitude of uh, the message. So uh, to further improve AI generated message, we sh what we should do is we should uh, make the message easy to read. We should mm -hmm. make the message have more objective information to help us to make decisions. So that's the implication, implication of uh, this study. So uh, yeah, to briefly conclude my presentation, so there are just too many topics I want to talk, but yeah, to conclude my presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so what is uh, AI research in our discipline? Mm -hmm. So again, I'm a, a scholar focused more on psychology part, so I, I, can, I can only explain, you know, from the psychology perspective. So I want to say it is a very unique and critical area. It is mm -hmm. the overlap between psychology and the technology uh, research. And in terms of uh, AI research in our discipline, in the discipline of uh, hospitality and tourism, in the discipline of a uh, service, our discipline basically provide a context for uh, what's called uh, human AI interaction research. That's a context. Mm -hmm. So when in the past two years, three years, I have reviewed, uh, you know, like uh, more than a hundred uh, peer review, uh, peer reviewed uh, journal uh, manuscripts mm -hmm. in uh, artificial intelligence, especially in our discipline. So uh, the major problem I found from a lot of uh, papers is that the paper cannot contribute to certain area in this model. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the paper cannot contribute to or cannot tell specifically to uh, the context, such as mm. why you conduct a study in hotel context. Mm. Why not a more broader, more general context? Or mm. well, sometimes the paper doesn't contribute to technology. Mm. Yeah, otherwise, why you choose AI? <laughs> right? You can choose any other technology, and your model will work the same. Right? So that's the major problem. I mean, like, what I want to really want to highlight is that our study should. Uh, Provide the contributions to these, uh, to both, to these three um, kind of uh, dimensions at the same time. Mm. That's right. Yeah, and some few, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Professor Ku. So some uh, future research direction there. Yeah, as uh, what we have discussed today, there are just too many future research directions. But in general, uh, five major uh, directions. The first one is a system, system design or agent design, mm. such as functionality, such as security design, bias, such as, you know, algorithm, such as anthropomorphic designs, right? So that's system, system design, mm. uh, which requires a more study, especially anthropomorphism, in my opinion. And the second branch will be a uh, service application. So basically, you know, this is, the other was service context. So how to apply AI in different service contexts, right? So in my, one well, of my previous study, as I uh, explained, we, can, we, we test uh, hedonic versus uh, utility-determined services, but there are many, many other dimensions about service. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How about like different genders? How about mm -hmm. like different cultures, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can test uh, using different, uh, uh, rather than Hofstad cultural dimension models, we use different cultural series. Mm -hmm. 
And third, the third branch is a human behavior or like human AI, human robot interaction mm. for both customer and employees. Because nowadays, there are a lot of studies for customers, but not too many for employees, maybe because of the availability of data. <laughs> that could be a reason. But we definitely need more studies, especially from the employee side. You know, this could be trust, attitude, different perceptions, right? The different acceptance. Um, and the first branch is a, you know, a broader focus that is the industry, as is the, the society. So such as like how does the AI application benefits um, the company financially, or in, in the context of tourism, how can we apply uh, apply AI in terms of destination planning, or how we can use AI to rejuvenate <laughs> a destination in terms of a life cycle, mm -hmm. how to increase job security, right? Reduce the negative impact on job security, or how we can we, we should uh, improve the ethical issues by, you know, applying AI devices to those type of topics. In the US, this one is a uh, is a very hot topic nowadays. Yes. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of research grants. <laughs> Uh, in this area oh. now, this is right. yeah. yes. Uh, yeah, and lastly, is a sustainability and well-being, such as like how does the use of AI you know influence the environment? Mm -hmm. How about like how to use AI to increase social interaction mm -hmm. rather than to, mm -hmm. to reduce social interaction? Right? How about mm -hmm. the customer satisfaction? Mm -hmm. How about how to use AI to reduce emotional mm -hmm. labor or burnout? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of topics we can understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's about the end of my presentation. And thank you all for your opinion. Okay, so, Oscar, back back to the slide, the last one. Um, I I want to comment on the future research direction. Mm -hmm. I I I highly agree with the your dimensions you are offered to us: uh, system design, service application, human behavior, industry and mm -hmm. society, and sustainable well-being. Especially, I, I, I have a high, I, I have a highly interest in the topics is anthropomorphism, like a mm -hmm. sub dimensions of anthropomorphism, how the, the, the dynamics happened between the anthropomorphism, okay, okay mm -hmm. dialogue interface and human like and um, action sort of things. Mm -hmm. And yes. also, okay, service task, you know. Depending on the repetitive work or routine work or complex work, creative work, probably service application AI have to provide different level of service interact with the humans and customers. That's, that's important. And like, again, the culture, like a Chinese culture, pretty much, you know, power-based culture from yes. the hierarchy to the low level. And um, US probably the European culture is pretty much individual culture. They, and um, they, they like more, you know, human-based interactions, probably may moderate some uh, the relationship. Exactly. And like a trust, you know, we have a three uh, sub dimensions of trust days, benevolence and uh, competency and um, the, what else? Um, uh, inter integrity. Integrity. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the perception. And uh, yeah, definitely, you know, uh, destination planning, trip planning. Mm -hmm. These days, you know, I, I ordered the chat GPT, hey, please make a trip planning for five days in LA. And they automatically, you know, uh, gave me the planning, their own decisions. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic one, and um, but we don't know exactly how they make that itinerary. The itinerary issue is a big one these days. You know, TripAdvisor, exactly. Expedia, Kulok, they provide the itinerary uh, supported by AI, uh, which is uh, sometimes uh, you know acceptable, not mm -hmm. acceptable, or favorable, non-favorable sort of things. Yes. And uh, also definitely ethics, ethical issue and uh, sustainable well-being. You know, I, I these days I, I'm, I'm currently a research on the, 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 the warm, okay, the emotional heart, emotional warming, 
like uh, the AI definitely uh, directly impact on the satisfaction or whatever. But you know, through the emotional aspect or through the, the warming of AI may be mediated by that mm -hmm. you know, emotional warming mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of things. So exactly. in, 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 in the, the, the future is definitely hospitality service industry will be replaced in many parts of uh, stuff is by AI robot and because of a lack of layer, labors. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely here is a lot of the, we are student here, hospitality, tourism, and leisure and uh, business. Uh, we, we, we need to focus on human AI interaction and interface mm -hmm. and depending on task and perception, ethics, planning, and mm -hmm. emotion. Mm -hmm. This is a huge chance ahead of us, actually, since the internet uh, emerged. Exactly. Okay. In, especially in terms of doing research. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, I feel like I, I usually feel like I don't have uh, enough time to do, to do like all different research topics. But yes, uh -huh. yes. there are a lot of, res uh, a lot of research, potential research topics in this field. Definitely. Yes. Okay, students. Um, please feel free to ask him about uh, any, you know, anything about his presentation or research. Yes, yeah, please feel free to let me know if you have any questions about, uh, you know, the presentations, research or methodology or mm -hmm. the questions. Yes. Yeah, I kind of like I didn't mention methodology too much because sometimes I feel like methodology is a little boring to talk. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Hi, hi, Professor. Thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. I have a question about uh, the part where you discuss the relationship between fun and long-term use of AI. Uh, as, as I understand, uh, the fun and long-term use of AI was integrated, uh, related each other. So is it correct to say that if using AI is fun, people would want to use it for a longer time? And if so, what factors can enhance users fun when using AI? So yeah, let me repeat your question. So uh, based on my understanding, you're, you're asking uh, like what factors can contribute to people's long-term use of AI? Is that right? Yeah. 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 So. That's a very, very good question. So in traditional technology research domain, there are a lot of research regarding long-term use intention. So in, in our discipline, the same. Um, I can't remember which year, but there is one paper published in International Journal of uh, Hospitality Management talking about uh, people's long-term intention to use, uh, to use uh, AI robots, I believe. Uh, I think the paper was published in 2019. I can't remember exactly, but uh, yeah, there are a lot of different factors. So I said, what I mentioned in my presentation, so the study, what we have done, primarily focus on trust because based on our literature, literature review, <laughs> we found that trust is kind of the number one factor uh, leads to people's long-term use intention. So that's like kind of the, so that's the, that's the focus of uh, our study. Um, however, as Professor Ku suggested, very likely in the field of artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, there are probably some other factors, maybe are more powerful than trust, but we still need to explore that. <laughs> All right, so we still need to explore that. Uh, in my opinion, before we should we can explore that, we should. Uh, do a more do more conceptual works. That is the to develop more series. Like say in traditional technology domain, people say okay, trust is the number one factor leads to long term uh, use intention. That's a theory, right? That's a theory in traditional technology domain. But how about in AI, AI domain? That's probably we probably we are going to see a different theory. But that's a that could be a very interesting research art, research research focus. Yeah, very good question. Hopefully, hopefully my answer uh, answered actually answered your question. Thank you. Okay. 
Is it enough for you, Anna? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, yes. Question. Yeah, that's a very good question. But yes, I'm sorry, I cannot provide more details because I need to think about how to ex extend our existing theory <laughs> in terms of long-term use. Oscar, what do you think about that? You know, like a chat GPT conversation. We uh, we we easily say like, okay, prompt engineering. And uh, depending on context of a prompt engineering, we can get the result differently using our you know, context questions. So there is a certain scenario. It's a mm -hmm. simple question and a little bit further question and complex question and the context question, just like a conversation between um, a doctor and um, the uh, uh, mm -hmm. physician and the, 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 the uh, customers, uh, they talking about uh, to find out their symptom of, uh, you know, they have. There's a certain way of question, you know, series. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that kind of, you know, uh, the framework? I, if I think we adopt. A, I, I think that's also a good idea. Like basically what we can understand in, in the US, we call it, we call it, like we call it, we call this uh, phenomena, um, what do you call it? Lehman programming. So basically oh. is that like Lehman program, basically is that instead of, you know, develop a complex uh, code to, oh. to, to, uh, to, to ask the, the AI do something, basically we can use our Lehman language, use regular English, right? To oh. ask the AI do something, but depending on the, the type of a uh, query, the type oh. of our Questions. We make uh -huh. all different answers. Yes. I mean, that could be an interesting research idea. You know, I think mm -hmm. in our field, mm -hmm. and uh, we can understand like, you know, rather than customers' general intention to use ChatGPT, but mm -hmm. we can focus uh, more specific on the mm -hmm. way people ask questions using ChatGPT. Right? How different people uh -huh. uh, in different ways to ask uh -huh. uh, questions, and then what are the uh -huh. consequences? Yeah, that is, that's a good idea, Professor. Uh -huh. That's interesting. So actually, this is in uh, you know the news. According to the newspaper, there it is totally depends on the the users' the capability how to manipulate the questions Q and A between ChatGPT and and then we can get a different consequence of that questions and then finally optimal solution we can get. Exactly. It's the, Com competency of the users, competence. or like or like uh, technology readiness or something like that, right? Uh -huh. Capability of using technology. I mean, but uh, one thing, one challenge we may have is that uh, let's compare the interaction between a human and the AI, and also the interaction between human and human. Mm -hmm. So the same is true for the interaction between human and human. So based on how we ask a person's question, we make out different, totally different answers, right? Yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so like we have to make it make it sure make make sure, mm -hmm. you know, our study, you know, have the contribution <laughs> in, in terms of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, other students, please. Yeah, other questions, everybody. Oh, I have a I have a mm -hmm. question. Sure. Um, and actually, the qualitative research uh, there is a, there are a qualitative research and quantitative research, and mm -hmm. do you think the AI uh uh, replace the qualitative research because the I because I have a question because the qual, qualitative research she has a uh, give her a lot of insight from the uh, marketing or other everything so but AI is just from the real data or so AI doesn't have a may may have uh, the creativity, but they don't have a really creativity. So I just, uh, uh, that's why I have a question on the cre uh, AI researcher. We can say AI researcher can replace the qualitative research. That, that's a very good think? question. Uh, actually, I received the, the same question last semester when I was in a research meeting. So basically, is that the question is that do, how do you think AI will challenge in terms of uh, uh, doing research, right? Like, yeah, I totally agree with you. As you mentioned, AI is basically is based on the summary of uh, of uh, big data, the summary of a lot of uh, um, 
let's say chat GPT, basically the summary of a lot of uh, quantitative information, a lot of uh, quantitative messages, right? So depending on, uh, my answer is that depending on what is our research focus. So if your research focus is, let's say, they say we are going to do a study called a systematic literature review. <laughs> it's also a type of a uh, um, qualitative study, right? So uh, yeah, basically the AI can provide a pretty good summary. Not now, not now, but maybe in near future, once the AI have the fully access to different journals, different databases, yes, the AI will do, will summarize the article pretty well. And maybe AI can do a better job in terms of uh, you know, create develop a framework by summarizing those articles, right? Because uh, it has much more, <laughs> much higher processing power than us. However, a lot of time when we do a qualitative studies, we are not only interest, interested in summarize something, but we also in, interested in like kind of explore new things. So let's, let's say when we do interview, right? So instead of like understand uh, people's behavior, we sometimes we inspire our interviewees to think about a phenomena and then lead them to deliberate like what is your perception. And in this case, AI cannot do that. AI is again based on basically based on association rule, right? Like when we talk about the gen, uh, generative AI, it's basically based on association rule, based on let's say uh, the association between different words and words. And then they come up with a message, right? So AI cannot create something new nowadays, um, at least based on the current AI technology. So that's why I want to say in terms of social science research, researchers are still needed, <laughs> both qualitative and quantitative, especially uh, um, you know, when we talk about AI, I believe, as I mentioned many times in, the, in this presentation, we need a theory development, we need a conceptualization, we need a <laughs> theoretical frameworks. So in case of, in, in terms of that, we need a, a lot of um, qualitative studies in the field. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, other student? Professor, I have a question. Sure, sure. please go ahead. Uh, thank you for your wonderful and interesting presentation. Uh, uh, in the recent years, we all know uh, with the development uh, with, with the uh, LLM, large language model and AI uh, development, the uh, technological innovation and the transformation driven by AI present both promoting opportunities and significant challenges to our society. Uh, those, changes, uh, those changes, I believe, they not only have the bright side and also have the dark side, uh, dark side as you, you mentioned as before. And this Advanced men not only enhance uh, consumer engagement and the uh, decision making uh, efficiency, uh, efficiency, but also broke the consumer resistance. Uh, and uh, I I have seen a paper about the uh, consumer resistant behavior to the mm -hmm. AI technology, and in China I also ha I have seen uh survey about uh, uh, AI technology adopt. And uh, most of the people uh, prefer, uh, uh, maybe due to the uh, cultural uh, difference, many people in uh, in China dislike those uh, smart way to do something. They, they, they are prefer the traditional way to do something in the hospitality and the tourism uh, actor. So uh, what do you think about the, uh, a dark side of the AI technology, and can you give us some uh, future uh, well, research direction about this? Uh, uh, about uh, the dark side of the AI technology. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for your question. Yeah, I totally agree that you know, as I mentioned, do you remember so the model I discussed before the AI DUA model? So basically, the model basically captures you know both acceptance and the objection. So I, I, I didn't explain the, uh, the, uh, the construct uh, very well. So in the model, the objection basically refers to that, you know, people refuse to use AI because they need, they need social interaction. 
So that's like how we measure objection in that model. But uh, I agree, like as you just mentioned, there are many different reasons for people to choose to not use AI. <laughs> many, many different reasons. So, uh, I mean, in terms of a future study or, you know, like objection is not necessarily dark side. So when we talk, talk about dark side, basically we refers to some negative consequence caused by AI application. So uh, in, let's, let's talk about these two, these, those are two different topics. So objection, there are many, many different factors may lead to objection. You actually brought up a very interesting point that is nowadays a lot of studies, they focus on object, they focus on willingness to use much more than objection to use. <laughs> Which, you know, again, we, do, we, we want to do more studies. We want to more study what are those psychological factors, right? The why people are afraid of AI. Maybe the challenge of human identity, that's one reason. Like Professor Ku suggested, the anthropomorphism may be another reason, right? So maybe different service contexts could be some reason people refuse to use AI. Um, and a lot of time people refuse to use, to refuse to use AI is basically based on because of uh, the high level of uh, perceived uncertainty. Right, those are all, all of these, these those are psychological factors can be con contributed to like, okay, why I don't want to use AI. Or familiarity could be also one factor. So yeah, again, more study is needed. Um, and in terms of dark side, that is a negative consequence <laughs> of AI application. So here in my research, I some major topics I'm currently doing is that one is fat, fan contemplation and the transparency. So uh, um, tr for example, like uh, fairness, and this is especially true in the US because you know, US has different uh, races. People have, have different cultural back uh, demographic background, right? A lot of people believe that AI performs better uh, to white population comparing to the black population, for example. So that's like a huge topic in the US because of what? because of the availability of data, right? Our model is trained based on the availability of data. And in the US, 70% population is white, but only like 10, around 10% 10 is black. So that's why, you know, it's based on the nature of how we train the AI program, the AI program will perform differently across the different uh, people with different uh, colors. So that's one, 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 one dark side, right? How to solve that? Another thing is uh, transparency, like how is basically deep learning is a black box. We have no idea how the AI come up with uh, a solution. We have no, totally have no clue. And like they say in terms of um, uh, autonomous vehicle, right? In, in some uh, uh, transportation emergency situation, <laughs> like how, how does the, the vehicle make the decision? Like whether the vehicle should hit the person, or whether the the, 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 the vehicle should hit uh, hit the, they say hit the uh, hit the, the other car, right? How does it yeah, make solution? So that's one thing. That's a uh, uh, transparency, accountability. Like like we have discussed, AI nowadays they are used as a social entity, as kind of. That's another type of human, basically another type of human. But who is responsible for them? Let's say we have a service failure. Let's say also use autonomous vehicle, all right? So let's say we have a traffic accident by using self-driving vehicle or self-driving taxi. And who is going to like take the responsibility? Is the or the designer of the vehicle? Like who? Or the, the users, right? That's another issue. So that's the kind of dark side or like result make a very clear explanation uh, about all of this. I want to say to apply AI is unethical. So that's that's a, that's like what I believe. Um, and another dark side is a, which is also a very hot topic nowadays. Also, yes. I'm going also doing research about that is a, a privacy. So the AI is, you know, the AI works based on data. So that's why they have to collect data, and they collect different data. When you are aware and when you are not aware, they collecting your data. Right, that could be another like dark side of AI, like how to protect people's private uh, privacy, right? So uh, yeah, um, but definitely, 
they are maybe more dark side <laughs> of yes. using AI. So I, a couple, I can't remember when, but I believe one year ago, I published a paper about like technology use <clears throat> in uh, heritage tourism. So in other paper, I also mentioned some other like specifically dark side in uh, the tourism industry, such as such as uh, tourism leakage. See, nowadays, oh yeah, those AI devices are, devi are manufactured or developed by those uh, kind of developing uh, development country, especially algorithms, right, are majorly developed by those development country. And then for developing countries, those tourism destinations, they have to import those devices in order to provide the services. That's, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term uh, tourism leakage. So basically that's a leakage. Money import products from a developed country and then you 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 you, you try to like you know use those technology to serve uh, travelers so basically yes, the revenue uh, you done yes right, right, right professor professor Ku, that's also a problem we have to understand we have to deal with that's a social issue yeah uh, actually yeah, in there, terms of uh, the emergence of the ai in these days, uh, yeah, dark side, bright side is is uh, like a uh, two two coins of a sword or two coins of you know exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, so you know hallucination like a fake leave and uh, artificial data there are a lot of things to do so exactly. it's it's it's, exactly. it's, a, it's hard topic yeah it's an important topic. That's a very good question. Thank you for your question. Yeah, okay, good. Thank and, you, Professor. Thanks for your com uh, comprehensive answer. It's very useful. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Please. Uh, okay, I go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Professor, for such a good um, and informative um, presentation. And I hope my question will sound okay, uh, because I'm not really, I don't think that I'm informed enough about smart tourism and specifically AI. Uh, but you talked about um, one of your uh, papers, uh, and when you introduced it, uh, uh, the research question was about how different cultures um, have different ideas about AI design. Mm -hmm. And you find out that US prefer more novel design, that means lower uh, anthropomorphism, and China prefer um, more human-like design. And my question is, do you think that the results of the study uh, are applicable uh, uh, to analyze all long-term oriented uh, and short-term oriented cultures, or it should be limited to these two countries? Thank you. That's a, that's a very good uh, question. So if you read the limitation part of the paper, um, I want to say, theoretically speaking, this, the results of, of this study should be, be able to apply to different cultures if the culture share the similarities. And uh, however, you know, like when we do studies, there are a lot of uh, methodological constraints. There are some, um, you know, more theoretical constraints. So I want to say it is useful to repeat the study in different cultures. It will be useful. Um, but from a scholar's perspective, researcher's perspective, I want to say like, maybe that's not a very good idea because if you found the exactly same results, you probably, <laughs> you waste a lot of time <laughs> to do the study. Uh, yeah, but that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, good. Other students? Mm -hmm. If you're not, I will ask. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Professor. You know, these days I I used to be I used I used to uh, be a master of um, structure equation modeling. I mm -hmm. I I adopted and I published a lot of papers using SEM, and now I. Um, moving from SEM to the experimental design uh, because it's, I try to find out causal inference exactly which variable 
as interact with which variable uh, and the cause and result is more specifically rather than general, you know, uh, antecedent of uh, mediation variable and the consequence of the mediation variable. So that's a current my position of research methodology. And also I collect data by text mining from TripAdvisor, like uh, uh, since the emergence of the ChatGPT 2020, 2022, December, since the time is now almost uh, one and a half years. And uh, quite, uh, I assume that there is something different from the those uh, the before ChatGPT and after ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. Because uh, me too, I I using ChatGPT a lot for my purpose and the research purpose. So industry probably they are using the ChatGPT, uh, for their well, respondents or mm -hmm. or marketing promotion or sort of things. So is I I I thought so the the like uh, the survey experiment is more effective than the general questionnaire based on theoretical framework. Uh, so I, I using the, those two methodology, chat, uh, the, the, the survey experiment and the text mining uh, together. Uh, so what do you think about that kind of a, a trend, methodology trend change? Yeah, I totally agree with you, uh, Professor Ku. Uh, yeah, I, I think we, I, I'm also doing the same thing. <laughs> so before I use a lot of SEM, yeah. uh, but nowadays, I want to say at least a half, more than half of my current research are using uh, ex experimental designs. Okay. <laughs> rather than, uh, rather than SEM. Yeah. Um, I want to say like, of course, uh, both of them, the, both methodologies have uh, their advantages and uh, for, uh, also are used for different purposes. Right, uh -huh. one is for test causality, and the other one is to basically demonstrate a theory. Um, even, and another thing is like I, I don't know how about you, Professor Ku. I, what I feel like, especially in our field nowadays, uh, more like mixed methods, multi-study uh -huh. designs is is kind of a requirement for top journals. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's probably another reason. You know, uh -huh. sometimes I use uh, like multiple methods in uh, a single paper to answer the same question. Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yes, I, <laughs> I, I made a decision that I'm moving from the SEM to the survey ex experiment design and the text mining and even panel, you know, data and uh, kind of a ex econometrics mm -hmm. yes. in order to publish the good uh, good journals. That's right. The, it's okay. SEM yeah. is no longer effective. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like we, we are forced to use methods, to learn different methods nowadays. Uh -huh. So oh, I, I saw one question in the chat. Okay, we have a question from student. Yeah. yeah let, let, let me let me read it real quick. <clears throat> so uh, now AI technology has a problem of lacking intimacy. Okay. Right. Let me just give this a slide. Yeah, well, let me put my meeting for you more time. Hmm. Well, that's a very interesting question. That's that's a very good question. That's a very general question, actually. <clears throat> so, um, I, um, I want to like share my kind of two opinions or two thoughts. One is that we should look back to our previous technology evolutions, like steam engine, <laughs> like personal computer. Right, mm -hmm. those previous uh, technology revolution, and every time when we experience technology revolution, we hear both positive and negative voice. And uh, every time, that's I think that's human nature. Like 
once if the technology can increase society's productivity, we eventually accept the technology. Mm -hmm. So that's our history. I have no idea how about this time, how about AI? Mm -hmm. but in terms of increasing productivity, I, I want to say AI is currently increasing our productivity. And uh, the second, uh, a second thought is, um, you know, like in order to make society have a consensus regarding the technology, we should uh, allow, we should enable everybody to be equally trained or everybody or saving the knowledge regarding artificial intelligence. But nowadays, not all people have knowledge regarding artificial intelligence. So in terms of that, I think we still need some time <laughs> to find out like what is the overall consensus of the society. Yeah, but that, that's a very good question. That's like more social, societal focused question. Yeah. Okay, uh, Professor Oscar Chi, um, uh, almost the time is up. Uh, let's uh, wrap up our uh, seminar. Thank okay. you very much today. Uh, Thank this, you. You're encouraging us uh, to do research on AI and technology in the context of hospitality and tourism and leisure and service area. Uh, uh, it's, it's a really, is, you are inspiring us uh, more, you know, e eagerly and more aggressively do some research on these topics. Yes, yeah, thank you, Professor Gu. Thank, uh -huh. uh, again, thank you for your invitation for this research seminar. It's a great research seminar. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, like, thank you, everybody, for your patience, for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm, uh, I look forward to see you uh, in a conference. It sounds or, good. Or... Yeah, yeah. Let's, we have, okay. I believe we will have, we will have a chance in the future. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Let Let's make one with the uh, mean you and me uh, about. Uh, I'll send the, the my uh, papers to you about. I got a research idea. Uh, from your presentations. Oh, sounds good. Sounds good. Let's, okay. <laughs> let's keep in touch, Professor Kuhn. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you very much, you. students. Uh, uh, let's finish up here. All right. Uh, Everybody have a nice day. <laughs> bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.